Okay. All righty then. What's happening, guys? What's happening, guys? All right. That's what it is, internet connection. What are you going to do? What's up, Sai Christian? Let's wait. Hopefully it gets better. How's the sound? Any buffering? Any buffering? What's happening? The sound okay? Okay. Keep praying for the internet connection, the sound to remain solid. Because like I said, until I get my own place and get my own internet connection, I'm at my brother's house and the internet connection is very old. <clears throat> he had no need to get fast internet because his children are grown. They have families of their own. So pre keep praying by the grace of Jesus in the name of the Father and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, to bless the strength of the internet connection that doesn't buffer, please, my God. So I can go into the depth of Scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hopefully the resolution will stay strong as well. But we'll wait a few more minutes for a few more faces to show up, regulars to show up. I don't know if Protestant Believer is going to be here. The verses, so meaning, you know, pace, but be that as it may. <clears throat> Just let me do something real quick. Hmm. Interesting. All righty then. Yeah, I was asked to discuss the different terms used for hell in the original languages of Scripture, right? The different terms used for hell in the you know, in the original languages of, of, of Scripture, you know, Hebrew and Greek. Because of, oftentimes when you read the King James Bible, fine, in the King James Bible, <clears throat> yeah, I'm the of spirit. Yeah, my, I don't know. I don't know where the router is. Hopefully, all right. Oftentimes in the King James Bible, two different Greek words are translated as hell. Two different Greek words are translated as hell, right? So I don't know if Protestant believers here. Is he here? Is the uh, first last here? Hold on. Let me just say. If not, that's fine. I'll just go into it. We're going to use the King James Bible to make my point. I'm going to do a lot of linking, <clears throat> a lot of cross-referencing, and it's going to be very slow and methodic. Like I said, I don't want to bore you in these sessions, but at the same time, I'm not here to entertain you, right? So I don't want to bore you, but I don't want to entertain you. <clears throat> Nonetheless, I want to educate you by the power of the Holy Spirit so that you don't end up becoming like David Wood, Hater Wood, hating the world, trying to destroy people's reputation and their ministry so he can hog all the viewers for himself, right? I don't want you to be like him. In fact, there are two types of Christians in the world. Guys, two types of Christians in the world. There's a type of Christian that teaches you how to live, how to behave, and be Christ-like. Then there is the other type of Christian that teaches you how not to live, how not to behave, how not to conduct yourself. And we need both types of Christians. David Wood is the beautiful, perfect example of what not to do, how not to behave if you're a follower of Jesus. Okay? Remember there? So he serves a purpose. Okay? <laughs> he serves a purpose. And you know what's funny, though? There are people who actually think I'm being serious. And they say, hey, is there a problem between you and Hater Wood? The only problem is on his end. He's just jealous and envious. But I still love him. Yeah, all right. Okay, is everyone clear? See, look, Rider of the Clouds. Did you catch it? Rider of the Clouds actually thinks that I'm being serious that somehow I have beef with David Wood. David Wood has beef with me. You know, I just have mercy and compassion on him, right? Yeah. Uh, Truth888, why are you here being stupid and asking me a question that's going to get you blocked? I just want to know, were you born stupid or did you have to work hard at becoming stupid? Just wanted to know. Just help me understand. We'll wait a few more minutes. We'll begin. By the grace of God. Yeah, I'll go. And hopefully the connection will stay strong. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. I don't know. 
Should be good today. I don't see why, right? So truth 88, help me understand. Were you born this way or did you have to develop such wonderful stupidity? Because I'm about to block you now, right? Okay. Well, that said, I'm going to trust that the internet connection is going to stay strong. The sound is going to stay, stay strong. And I'm going to proceed. So pray for me. Wish me well. We just want to ask the Father <clears throat> to bless this session in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, just this session for your glory. Holy Spirit, bless this session and use me to glorify Jesus Christ. We praise you and we love you, Father. We praise you. We love you, Lord Jesus. And we praise you. We love you, Holy Spirit. You are the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please, Holy Spirit, anoint this session. Anoint my mouth to speak truth without error, to recall scriptures correctly, interpret them correctly by your power for the glory of Jesus. May I decrease. May we decrease. And let Jesus increase in us, Holy Spirit. Please have your way. Bless this session. Bless everyone present to understand. Grant us wisdom and knowledge, understanding the depth of the word that you inspired, that you produced, Holy Spirit, for the glory of Jesus, to know God through the word that you have inspired and preserved. Enable us to plunge the depth of that word, to know the word that you've revealed, preserved, and give us the power to live out that word and love that word and proclaim that word and die for that word and transform us to become more like Jesus. Save me from error and stammering and confusion. Bless the people with understanding and wisdom and power to get the point of these passages and live them out passionately in your power for the glory of Jesus and save us from the evil and cover us with the blood of Jesus. Purify us, cleanse us in the holy blood of Jesus, the Father's beloved and holy Son. And give me the health I need, Holy Spirit, to do this. Fill my lungs, my chest, my throat with the health I need to glorify Jesus Christ by your power. Bless our loved ones and bless my daughters and preserve them for the glory of Jesus, Holy Spirit. We need you. Have your way and bless the internet connection and save us from attacks of the evil one. In Jesus' name. Hello, Father, Son, Spirit. Hello, Father, Son, Spirit. Okay. Anyway. Okay. Are we ready? All righty then. Andrew, what's up, buddy? Good to see you. If we're ready, I'm going to have to... I'm going to be reading the Bible passages, folks. We don't have the regular gang. We don't have Protestant believer. We don't have first and last to post verses. So I'm going to read aloud the passages like I normally do, but you're not going to be able to see them in the text, if that's okay. Pray the Lord Jesus blesses me to bless you, right? And save us from attacks. Oh, first last is here? Oh, okay. Attacks of the enemy to restrain the enemy from sending his dogs to attack us so we can focus on glorifying Jesus Christ. So are you here, uh, first last? How you doing, Nada? Good to see you, sister. Good to see everyone. Andrew, good to see you. Oh, Andrew, you wanted to learn this? Okay. All right. I don't know. You said first last is here. Is he now where? Where is he, Sina? Is he like invisible or something? Only Zena sees people that I don't see. Right? Zena, do you see dead people? Okay. I was asked to explain the difference between Sheol slash Hades or Hades and Gehinna. Gehinna. See, this is what happens, Ian, when I speak presumptuously. Zena ends up vindicated, and I end up making a braying ass of myself. And I know she loves every minute of it because being a Syrian, she loves it when an Assyrian man makes a fool out of himself. Okay. First, last, let me know when you're ready, buddy. Let me know when you're ready. If you're not ready, it's okay. I won't pay you why what I usually pay you for helping me, which is nothing. He's here. Okay, get in the saddle, pray. Guys, keep praying so that the, the picture and the resolution and sound stay strong because it's beyond my control until I get my own place. Okay. I'm going to try to do my best, trusting again the Holy Spirit to guide me and to interpreting the passages correctly because that's my hope, my trust. My hope and trust is in the Holy Spirit to protect me from error, to anoint me to speak truth, and then give us, give us all the power to understand these things and live them out for the glory of Jesus. All right. Let's go to Luke 16, 23 and Matthew 10, 28. Luke 16, 23 and Matthew 10, 28. We're going to look at it in the King James Version. Luke 16, 23. Merrick, 
Ask my question one more time. You will be blocked from here and blocked from my Facebook. Go ahead, please make my day. Ask me one more time. Go ahead, one more time. Luke 16, 23 and Matthew 10, 28. Okay, pay attention now. Read. The King James translates two different Greek words the same way. Okay, read with me Luke 16, 23. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, Matthew 10, 28. Read with me. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, this glorious translation. Blessed by God for over 300 years to bless English-speaking churches, to get to know the true God, to know the Lord Jesus, know the Holy Spirit, and to experience salvation, King James, renders two different Greek words as hell. To now prove the point that in these two passages, in Luke 16, 23, Luke 16, 23, and Matthew 10, 28, it's two different Greek words that are being translated as hell. Okay, let me prove it to you. Here, I'm going to give you the link to the interlinear Greek New Testament, which provides a transliteration of the Greek words, right? And the translation of the Greek itself, so that you don't need to be a scholar and read Greek to see it. Here's Matthew 10, 28. You're going to have to click on the link and see it for yourself. Matthew 10, 28. Click on the link. Here it is. Everyone, pay attention. Pray the Spirit fill us for the glory of Jesus to save me from Aaron, to bless you and challenge you and just convict you by the Spirit to go deeper into the Word and see how amazing the Word is. Now, when you click on it, first and last provided the Greek. For those of you who can't read the Greek, when you click it, you're going to see, okay, in Jesus' name, Lord, please, for your glory, bless the connection. You're going to see the word Gehinna. Gehinna. Do you see that? Now, he provided the Greek words, but unless you read Greek, you won't be able to make heads or tails, right? What these words sound like, okay? Do you see it? It's Gehinna. Did you click on it? Yeah, but see now, first last, you and I can look at the Greek and sound it out. I'll let, you know, I can sound out the Erasmian way, which I butcher the Erasmian butchering of Greek. But yep, Gehinna. But those who can't read Greek can't tell. Gehinna. Does everyone see it? Let me click the link again. Let me give you the link one more time. May the Lord loosen my tongue to speak clearly. Gehinna. Well, copy and paste it, Angela. If you can't click on it, copy and paste and see what happens. Okay. Gehinna. Yeah. Now, that's the Greek word for Matthew 10, 28. Now, let me give you the Greek word for Luke 16, 23. I'm going to give you the link here. Click on the link or copy and paste it. And then you're going to see that the rich man who died... He's not in Gehinna. He's in Hades. Hades or Hades. Hades. Here you go. Yeah. Andrew, when you see Gehinna, when it's translated in English, they'll put an H because many New Testament scholars claim and argue that when you see that little sign on top of that's the breathing sign. So you say Gehinna. May the Lord Jesus pr protect me from my lisp. Okay? So you're reading as Gehinna, but scholars will translate as Gehinna. But when native Greek speakers pronounce it, they don't say Gehinna. From what I gather, and first last speaks Greek, it's Gehinna, right? Do you make the breathing sound first last? Do you say Gehinna or is it just Gehinna? No breathing sound. Do you make a breathing sound first and last when you just want to just want to see? Okay, see, so he doesn't pronounce the breathing sound. 
Gahina, he'll go Gahina, he'll emphasize where he sees that little sign on top of the word, the apostrophe. He won't do a breathing sound. Gahina, he'll say Gahina, but non native. New Testament scholars, when I say not native, who are not Greek, who don't speak Greek, whose mother tongue isn't Greek, who don't know conversational Greek, when they teach you, they'll teach you that when you see that apostrophe, when you see that line on top of the E, or any word, not just the E, any other word, then you must make a breathing sound. Gehina. That's what they'll tell you. But when I hear native Greek speakers who speak conversational Greek, whose mother tongue is Greek, right? They don't make the breathing sound. They don't go, Gehina. It's Gehina, right? You with me? Thank you, Ar. God bless you. You with me? Is that making sense? So if you want to learn to pronounce Greek in a manner that resembles the way Greek speakers speak Greek, learn it from a Greek speaker. Learn Greek from those who speak Greek, whose mother tongue is Greek, because then you'll be able to pronounce the New Testament in a way they can understand what you're saying. Because if you go up to a Greek speaker, and I were to read math, uh, John 20, 28, where Thomas says to Jesus, my Lord and my God, the Greek, if I pronounce it the way they teach us in colleges and seminary, they'll laugh at me. They'll laugh. Ask first and last. Open up John 20, 28, and then pronounce it the way your professors or like James White pronounces it, and the Greek speakers don't look at you baffled. What in the world did you just say? What language is that, man? That ain't Greek. That's why now you have a movement, and I'm not lying. King of kings, I'm not lying. This is the truth. You now have a movement among Scholars or teachers of New Testament Greek abandoning the Erasmian pronunciation of Greek and now starting to pronounce it as native Greek speakers pronounce the Greek today. So you're now having many scholars and students of New Testament Greek abandoning this way of pronouncing the Greek called the Erasmian pronunciation and learning conversational Greek or modern Greek and then pronouncing the New Testament Greek the way modern Greek speakers speak Greek. Right? And folks, don't let... See, first last, he speaks Greek. Isn't it pure butchery? When you hear James White or someone else, Danny Wallace, speak the Greek, don't you cringe? And folks, don't let James White deceive you. I have it on good record, and I'm actually going to meet him. Steve, Stephen Anderson is a scholar of the Greek New Testament and Aramaic and Hebrew. In fact, he knows about 17 languages, and he speaks German fluently. That's why when you see Stephen Anderson pronouncing the Greek, he pronounces it flawlessly like a native Greek speaker does. Whereas when James White does it, it's because he learned the Erasmian pronunciation. It's gibberish to a native Greek speaker. And I'm not lying. First last. See, see, listen. First last speaks Greek. Am I lying? First last? What I just said? Can you confirm? Stephen Anderson knows how to pronounce the Greek, not James White and other New Testament scholars. See? Read his comments. First last. He speaks Greek. Okay, now forget that. That's neither here nor there. Let's focus on Luke 16, 23. Remember in Matthew 10, 10 28, Matthew 10, 28, use the word Gehinna. And by the way, Andrew, I don't want to mislead people. I'm no scholar of the Greek or Hebrew. I'm not even a good student. I'm learning as I go along. So I would never try to pass myself off as an expert in the languages. God forbid. I'm indebted to those who are scholars. But because of that, I'm open to hearing different perspectives on how to pronounce biblical Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek. Because I know that when I hear a Daniel Wallace or a James White say, ha, kuriasmu, kai, ha, theosmu, 
That's not how they would have pronounced it at the time of Christ, nor is it the way that Greek speakers today pronounce it. Right? Okay, now here's the link. Folks, let's focus in Jesus' name by the power of the Holy Spirit as you pray that the Spirit fills me to bless you for the glory of Christ. Okay, now, click on that link. You're going to see that in the case of the rich man, the word that the King James translated as hell, right? Translated as hell isn't Gehenna. It's Hades. Isn't Gehenna. The word that the King James translators translated as hell in Luke 16, 23, isn't Gehenna. It's Hades. Everyone got it? Are you guys telling me or am I losing you? Am I boring you? One thing I don't want to do is bore you, but I don't necessarily entertain you. I want to be used of the spirit to educate you. Okay, so now did everyone get it? Did you see that in Luke 16, 23, the rich man, when he died and was buried, he found himself in Hades, which the King James translated as... <clears throat> Hell. Now, the Hebrew equivalent of this Greek word is Sheol. Sheol. Okay. The Greek word Hades corresponds to the Hebrew word Sheol. Sheol. Everyone with me there? Everyone with me there? The word here in Luke 16, 23 is Hades. This Greek word corresponds to the Hebrew word Sheol, Sheol. In Matthew 10, 28, the word is Gehenna. It's not Hades. It's two different words. Now, what's the difference between Hades and what's the difference between Gehenna? Let's look at Luke 16, 22 to 23, and you'll see what the difference is. Praise the Lord, Cindy. That's right, Gado, you got it. And masking, there's a debate whether it was the garbage dump in the Valley of Hanam. Don't worry about that because that's not how the Bible is using it on masking fools. Okay. Luke 16, 22 to 23. Read with me. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Buried. But then notice 23. And in hell, he lift up his eyes. Okay, folks, if he was buried, what part of him ended up in hell or Hades? What part of him was buried? What part of him ended up in, ha in hell and Hades? God, you remember from yesterday. God bless you, brother. So what part of the rich man ended up being buried? What part of him ended up in Hades? So what part of him was in Hades? Help me. Come on. His soul, his spirit. And what part of him was buried? His body. Okay. Now, what's the difference between Hades, Sheol, and Gehenna? Go to Matthew 10, 28. Matthew 10, 28. Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Here's the difference. Hades in Greek, Sheol in Hebrew, can refer to the grave or it can refer to the abode of the dead when their spirit souls leave their bodies. Okay, follow with me. You got to now pay attention so I don't lose you. Before Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven, everyone who died, their souls, their spirits, went to Sheol, Hades, the realm of the dead. The difference between Hades and Sheol and Gehenna is Gehenna is the place where the body and the soul of the unbeliever is sent to be destroyed. Clear? You see what the difference is now, right? So if someone tells you, 
what's the difference between Hades and Hebrew Sheol and Gehinna? The difference is up until now, you got to pay attention. Yes, Andrew, pay attention. Up until the time of Christ's ascension to heaven, all who died, all who died, their souls and spirits would leave their bodies and go to the realm called Hades and Sheol. That's where the rich man was. After the resurrection of the dead, after the day of judgment, Christ will take the souls of unbelievers that are being tormented in Hades, unite them to their bodies, and then throw them body and soul into hell. Matthew 10, 28, one more time. Yep, the lake of fire. Matthew 10, 28, one more time. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul, soul and body in hell. And the Greek word is Gehinna. Gehinna is where the soul and the body of the unbeliever, unbeliever are sent to be destroyed. Mark 9, 43 to 48. Mark 9, 43 to 48. Mark 9, 43 to 48. I'm going to get you the link to the Greek. Hold on. All righty then. Let's see. Okay. Let's read. Read with me as he posts. God bless him for serving us. Okay, read with me. Okay. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter life maim than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Guess what the word hell is there? It's Gehinna. And notice it's referring to physical body parts. Cut off your physical hand because it's better that you enter life with one hand than having both your physical hands tormented in the fire of Gehinna, where the worm dieth night and not, and their fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter halt into life, right, maim, than having two feet to be cast into hell. Guess what the word is in Greek? Gehinna. Into the fire that there shall never be quenched. Okay? Into the fire and then we quench, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now, where's 47? You skip 47, and because of that, you're going to get smashed. Don't, don't be thanking us. You're, you're dropping the ball. You posted 46 again, you sinner. Where's 47, buddy? And if thine eye off offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The word hell there is Gehinna. Click on it. Do you see it? What's the word? What's the word? Gehinna. It's in the accusative. Gehinna. Gehinna. So you see Jesus again is referring to the physical body being thrown into hell. Right? You with me there? Everyone there? Do you now see what's the difference between Hades and Gehinna? And the Greek, the Hebrew word for Hades is Sheol. So this is the thing you need to keep in mind. Andrew, you're confusing me, brother. Now, Merrick, I don't want to answer him because he's coming in lately, wasn't paying any attention, was distracting me with a question that wasn't rele relevant to the topic. But, Andrew, why in the world would you be confused when the Bible says that which is in the dust will be raised out of the dust? Did you forget the resurrection of the dead, both the righteous and the wicked, Andrew? Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. That's why I ignored Merrick. Because he wasn't paying attention. Had he been paying attention, he'd follow along. So 
Why, Andrew, are you confused? Did you forget that the dead will be raised in their bodies? Daniel 12, verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Why are you guys confused all of a sudden? Did you see that, Andrew? Daniel 12, 2. Those that sleep in the dust shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. What about John 5, 28 to 29? Where's the confusion, folks? John 5, 28 to 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves, Andrew, pay attention, graves, shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So, Andrew, when the dead are raised from the dust who are evil to be condemned, where will they be sent? Where will they be sent? Let me try it again. Where will they be sent? Andrew, you're killing me. I love you, bro. I just spent 20 minutes explaining what happens to the bodies and souls of unbelievers. And you guys are not getting it? Thank you. Everyone else except faith God's child is getting it. Gahinna. Why did I just waste? No, Truth 88, you're not even paying attention. You need to leave because you're too busy talking about Rabbi Yitzchak Shapiro. Leave. Okay. Let's try this again. It's okay, Andrew. Don't worry about it. That just shows you that I love you just as much as the rest, which is why I punish you like the rest. I'm an equal opportunist offender. I just spent over 10 minutes explaining what happens to the bodies and souls of unbelievers. They are sent to Gehenna. What's the difference between Gehenna and Hades Shoal? Hades Shoal is where the souls of unbelievers are now sent to be tormented as their bodies lay in the dust. But Gehenna is where their bodies will awake from the dust, unite with their souls, and then souls and bodies together sent to hell to Gehenna. Is it making sense now? Do you guys now see the difference between Hades slash Sheol and Gehenna? Even though the King James translates these words the same in many places, it's not the same Greek word and it doesn't have the same application. Okay. So if someone now asks you, what's the difference between Gehenna and Hades slash Yo? The difference is now after Christ, when an unbeliever dies, the bodies go to the dust, their souls leave their bodies, spirits leave their bodies, enter torment until the day of resurrection, where Jesus will then awaken their bodies from the dust, Unite their bodies with their souls, their spirits, and then body and soul will be sent into Gehenna, into hell. Yep, and the Gehenna is the second death, the lake of fire. Okay, is it now making sense, the difference... Between Hades, Hades, Sheol in Hebrew, and Gehenna. Yes. Hades, Irene, remains until Christ comes. Let me prove it to you. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11, 15. Hades and death will also be sent into Gehenna. Did you know that? Revelation says, Hades and death will be thrown into the lake of fire and the lake of fire is Gehenna. Here, read with me. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat, sat on it. Revelation 20, verses 11, 15. Read. 
Read, please. I want you to catch it. Revelation 20, verse 11, 15. I saw a great white throne, great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. 13 and 14, 15. Read now. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And the death and death and hell. Guess what the word hell is? Guess what the word hell is? Hades. Death and Hades, Hades, right, <clears throat> were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. <whistles> hmm. Revelation 20, 13, 14. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell, Hades, de delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. 14 again. Death and hell, the Greek word here is Hades, Hades, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, folks, let it sink in. In Revelation 20, 13 to 14, it says, Death and Hades, which the King James rendered hell, gave up their dead. Then death was taken and hell, Hades, were taken and thrown into the lake of fire. Do you want me to give you the link to prove that the word hell in Revelation 20, 13, and 14 is Hades, not Gehenna? Do you guys want the link for that? Here you go. Even though first last is posting the Greek. Watch here. Let me go. So you don't think I'm making it up. So this is why if you don't have access to the Greek manuscripts or an interlinear, or a Strong's or a lexicon, you won't see that the King James translation is rendering two different words as hell. Right? Here you go. Did you catch it? Click on it. There you go. The word translated hell in the King James. What is it? Hades, Hades. Medic, the reason why King James Version does it is because everyone speaks of people dying and go to hell. Right, right now, if I say, Medic, when Hitler died, where did he go? He went to hell. So even in the English language, we use the term hell for both Hades and for Gehenna. Is it clear now? Okay, now why does John say death and hell, Hades, will be thrown into the lake of fire? Jerry Duke, Hades existed for good and bad up until the time of Christ. After Christ's ascension, things changed, Jerry Duke. But good, you're paying attention. I'll prove that to you in a minute. Okay, Jerry Duke? Ask me that question a little later. Okay. Why are death and Hades thrown into hell when death and Hades are not persons and they haven't sinned, committed no wrong? Why? This is John's way of personif personifying, taking inanimate places that are not persons, personifying them. This is what we call personification. That's a literary feature. We use it to this day where we take something that's inanimate, not personal, and personify it, right? So what is John trying to tell you in that personification? <clears throat> what is he trying to illustrate by describing death and Hades as actual persons will be thrown into the lake of fire? Well, let me explain. Death means physical death. Hades refers to the place where the souls of the dead go. What he means is after the resurrection, pay attention, this is what he means. After the general resurrection, where all the dead are raised and all the souls in Hades come out and are united to their bodies, there'll be no more physical death 
where the souls separate from bodies, so there'll be no more need for the grave or Hades. It will be over from that point onwards. Thank you, Fabio. You understand what he's saying here? When the general resurrection of the dead takes place, no more physical death for anyone. Therefore, if there's no more physical death, you won't need death anymore to cause physical death, and you won't need Hades anymore for the souls of the physically, physically dead to go to if they're unbelievers. That will be over with. So this is John's way of saying Hades will no longer exist as a place for the dead and physical death will no longer occur. Does it make sense now? Is it sinking in? Are you learning and going deeper into the scriptures? Is it making sense? Thank you, Colin, for those kind words. Pray I'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, possessed of the Holy Spirit, sealed by the Holy Spirit, and every fabric of my being being controlled by the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ. Okay. So you understand now what Revelation 20, 13, 14 is saying. Okay. Let me, one more time. I repeat myself more than once because we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear things over and over again. This is what John is telling in Revelation 20. Physical death. And Hades, where the souls of those who physically die, go to if they're unbelievers, will no longer be needed because at the general resurrection, all the dead will be raised, united to their bodies, and believers will dwell with Christ, and unbelievers will be sent in their bodies and souls attached to, ha to, to Gehenna, hell, Gehenna, hell, not Hades. So you won't need Hades anymore, and there won't be any more physical death. That's what he's saying. Yes, Dilla John, when Jesus comes back. So now is it making more sense? The difference between Hades, which in Hebrew is Sheol, and Gehenna. Okay. I'm going to answer the question, if you're patient with me, and just be patient. I'm going to get to the answers. I'm going to show you where Jesus went for those three days. He didn't go to Gehenna, hell, and the lake of fire. When the King James says that Jesus' soul was not abandoned in hell, the Greek word is Hades. And he went to Hades, but he went to Abraham's bosom. He went to Hades, but he went to that part of Hades where Abraham was. So Jesus did go to hell, but the word hell in the Greek is Hades. And at that time, Hades had two compartments. Abraham's bosom, where they were in rest and comfort, and the, the part where unbelievers were tormented. You, you catch it? Jesus went to God, Father, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Please, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Okay. Jesus went to Hades. He went to Hades. The King James renders the Greek Hades as hell. That's where people get confused. And I'll look at that in Acts 2 in a, in a minute. But if you go back and look at the Greek word, no, we don't know if it was a dumpster outside of Jerusalem in the Valley of Hinnom because that information comes from medieval sources. We don't have any sources contemporary with Christ or before Christ that testifies to such a place, Gerald. Stop asking me an irrelevant question. Even if it's such a place existed, Jesus is still using the metaphor for the destruction of the wicked at the end of the age. So what if it's referring to a garbage dump? What has that got to do with Jesus' use of the metaphor? Is everyone clear now with me? When it says, send Abimelech on his way. When it says, Jesus went to hell. The Greek word is Hades, Hebrew Sheol. 
It doesn't mean he went to the flames and fire of fire and was tormented. Because you remember yesterday, Luke 16, 19 to 31, the parable of the rich man Lazarus, which I did an entire session on. Abraham and the rich man were all in the same spiritual dimension. They could see each other, but there was a gulf separating them so that Abraham couldn't go to him and he couldn't go to Abraham. And on Abraham's side was peace and comfort. On the other side was torment. So when Jesus went to Hades, guess where he did not go? To the place of torment, he went to the place of peace and rest and comfort, Abraham's bosom. No, brother, for the love of the triune God, what does purgatory got to do with Hades? Tartarus is not used in Revelation. It's used in Peter. 2 Peter 2.4. Everyone with me there? Don't worry about it, medic. It's because we got people. Listen, we got people here who want to pontificate and impress us with their knowledge of Scripture, so they keep throwing stuff out like Tartarus to impress us. Oh, wow, you're so educated. You know about the word Tartaro used in 2 Peter 2, 4, Tartarus? Wow, you're a scholar, and so distract us. You see why I have a problem with these people? You, got, you understand my frustration now, right? They can't just shut up, listen, and ask relevant questions. They got to chime in to impress us, and they're not impresses, uh, impressing us because I end up embarrassing them. What was the point of him mentioning Tartarus? Ask him. Ask this chief. Okay, Tartarus. Okay, what's Tartarus, friend? Is that tartar sauce that you put on fish? What did you gain by throwing out a word to try and impress us, and you didn't impress us? You made an ass out of yourself. You see, Vine, why my sessions isn't for everyone? You see, Vine, why? Because people want to impress me, and they don't know. I don't get impressed. I get disgusted because I see them as arrogant snots who want to come off as they know what they're talking about. Stop trying to impress me. I'm not your savior. I'm not Jesus. Even if you impress me, whoopee do da day. Right? Can we focus now? And I'm going to get better at this. By the power of the Holy Spirit, if I keep doing this, I'm going to get to a point where I'm going to ignore the trolls and just block, block them and bounce them. Okay? Clear? Okay, now, so we don't lose focus. Focus on what I just said. Okay? Okay, focus on what I just said. And it's not anger, it's passion right now, groom. Get Make the distinction between two. When Jesus went to hell, it wasn't Gehenna, the lake of fire, and it wasn't that part of Hades where they were tormented because I'm going to show you right now, if you're patient with me and listen, that up until Jesus' ascension to heaven, up until that time, everyone went to Hades and Sheol, but not everyone went there in torment. Some people were there in torment. Others were there in peace. So when Jesus went to Hades, he didn't go to the place of torment. He landed on the side of Abraham, which was a state of peace. Right? Yep, please hit the like button. You with me so far? Because now I'm going to give you the evidence. I'm going to give you the evidence. Are we ready for the evidence? If you're ready for the evidence, we can proceed. Okay. Now, let's go to Genesis 37. Now, before I give you the references, I want you to understand the context. Okay. Here's the context. Joseph's brothers have sold them to the Midianites, Ishmaelites. In order to cover up what they did to their father, Jacob, they took his coat, right, killed one of the flock, and then smeared the coat in the blood of that, the animal, and then presented to Jacob saying, here's your son's cloak. And so Jacob, when he saw the cloak with the blood, assumed Joseph had been mauled by an animal. 
So they deceived Jacob into thinking Joseph had been murdered by an animal, right? That's the context. If you're ready, let's now see what Jacob's going to say. Genesis 37, 31 to 35. Genesis 37, 31, 35. Now, Vine, pay attention, because this is further proof from the Hebrew Bible that the patriarchs knew of, of an afterlife, and they didn't believe in soul sleep. Genesis 37, 31, 35. Read with me, folks. And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. Pay attention. Dipped the, the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, this have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he, and he knew it and said, it is my son's coat. An evil beast. Pay attention. This is where you got to listen now. Hath devoured him. Eaten him up. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. Now watch here. Here's where you're going to get blown away. 34, 35. And Jacob rent his clothes, signs of mourning, put sackcloth upon his loins, Mourned for his son many days, but now pay attention, 35. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. Pay attention now. And he said, for I will go into the grave unto him, unto my son. I will go to the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Number one, folks, the word grave in the Hebrew is sheol. Guess what the Greek translates this? Guess what the Greek rendering of the word Sheol is? The word grave in Hebrew is Sheol. When they translate in Greek, okay, the word in Hebrew is Sheol. When they translate it in Greek, Hades, Hades. But now let's read it one more time. Let's read that part one more time. You guys didn't catch it. Vine, let's see if you caught it. Andrew, let's see if you caught it. Let's see if you guys catch it one more time. No, Zarina, where'd you get Gehinna? Zarina. It's not Gehinna. Gehinna is the place where the body and soul are thrown to be tormented. Okay, for I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. This is why I say that this translation can confuse you because here, here, the word grave can confuse you. Because it's saying that I'll be, I'll go down to the grave with my son. But folks, he just said his son had been eaten alive, torn to shreds by a wild animal. His son wasn't placed in any grave. So how could he say that I'm going to go to the grave where my son is when your son isn't in the grave, Jacob, according to you? You get it now? He can't be referring to the grave. Because Joseph was not placed in any grave. He just told you an animal tore him to shreds, ate him up, killed him, tore him to pieces. So what do you mean you're going to go down to the grave to him? He's not in any grave, Jacob. Did it sink in? I want it to sink in before I move on. I want it to sink in before I move on. Did you understand that he could not be referring to a tomb? He could not be referring to a tomb because he just told you. Didn't you read it? Oh, an animal has torn him to shreds, has, has, eaten, has mauled him, torn him to pieces. So then Jacob, what do you mean you're going to go down to the grave with him? He's not in any grave. You just said it. David, are you serious, dude? David, I don't know if you're paying attention, bro. You're hurting me. Did you just read the context? They just took a, a cloak of his, dipped it in the blood of a goat, and presented it to him. What wrap it? What bury it? What are you talking about, dude? Did you just listen? Genesis 37, 31, 35. There was no body. So how can Jacob go to the grave where his son is when his son's body isn't in any grave? medic he wasn't even killed there's no body but jacob thought he was de dead but how could jacob say i'm going to the grave to my son jacob what grave you don't know where your son is buried as far as you're you're concerned 
an animal tore his body to shreds. Is it making sense before I move on? Yes, unmasking fools. What he was saying is, I will die and my spirit will join him in Hades. I will see him there in Hades. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about my body will be buried next to his body. My soul will descend to meet his soul in the afterlife. Bam! This refutes the lie that the Old Testament saints had no knowledge of the afterlife. They all knew about the afterlife. They all knew that when you die, it wasn't final. Your souls left your bodies and entered the netherworld. They all knew it. Is it making sense? Because it was fine. It was a sleepy, shadowy place, not where you sleep, but a shadowy place in that it was a place in which you were less than human. You're a shadow of yourself because to exist apart from the body means that you're less than human, Vine, and you're not dwelling in the presence of God, meaning his visible presence like angels do. But Jesus changed all that, Vine, and I'm going to get there point by point. No, we can't, Medic. Let me stop the entire session, Medic, to help you because you need help with JWs. Let me forget everyone else who's paying attention because Medic needs attention. Help me, please. Please help me. I'm weak. You know I'm weak. Help me. No. Jot in. What you're finding among the Greeks is the common revelation that God had revealed to all which they took and perverted and embellished. John Inc., let me repeat, let me repeat what I just said. Hades wasn't a pagan concept. Hades is a revelation that God gave to Noah and all his descendants. But what they did was they took the revelation, corrupted it, embellished it, added to it, subtracted from it. That's why you find common motifs and stories among all cultures, like a flood story and a race of giants sired by divine beings. Where do you think all of this came from? This is all based on actual historical events that the cultures knew of, but then took these stories and embellished them, corrupted them, and the Bible gives you the pure, true, correct version of these events. Everyone with me so far? Before I move on? Okay, did you catch what Jacob was saying? That he's going to go down to Sheol to meet his son there. And the Greek word is Hades. So did you see that Jacob knows when he dies, he goes to Hades? Do you see it? And that's where he thought Joseph's soul went because he thought Joseph died. I'm going to reunite with my son in Hades. Because if he's dead, his soul is there. I'm going to meet him there. Clear? Yeah, before I move on, I want to make sure you're getting it. So according to Jacob's own testimony, when they all died, where did they go? Where did they go before Christ's ascension into heaven? Where did they all go according to Jacob? Hades, bam, Sheol, yeah, praise the Lord. But now let me show you from Abraham again. Genesis 15, 15. Genesis 15, 15. If you're not bored, I'm going to go real slow, hold back on your questions and focus, or you're not going to get this. Genesis 15, 15. Notice what God says to Abraham. Guys, I mentioned it yesterday. I'm going to repeat it again. This passage I mentioned yesterday. I'm going to repeat it again. Pay attention. Genesis 15, 15. God speaking to Abraham says, thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Notice, thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Hmm, in peace. He has to reassure him. You're going there in peace. 
Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Folks, don't take my word for it. Tonight, read Genesis 23 and then read Genesis 25. When Abraham died, he was buried in Canaan in the cave of Machpelah. The only other body in that cave was that of Sarah. There was no one else buried in the cave. It was only Sarah. And then when Abraham died, his body was buried next to her. Only those two were in the cave. But now notice Genesis 15, 15, though. One more time. Genesis 15, 15. Watch here. One more time. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Abraham's ancestors and fathers were from Ur of Chaldee, Genesis 11, 22 to 32. When they died, they were all buried there. Abraham's own father, Terah, was buried in Haran. None of them were buried in the cave. But here God says, when it's time for you to die, I'm going to gather you to your fathers where they're at in peace. How did God do that? His fathers were not buried in the cave. His own dad wasn't buried in the cave. He was buried in Haran, and the rest were buried in the roof of Chaldee. There was no other person buried in the cave except Sarah. But God says, at death, I'm going to take you to be with your fathers. I'm going to take you to be where your ancestors are. How did God take him to be with his ancestors? Where was his ancestors? And Sheol in Hades. That's why God then assures him, when I gather you to them, you'll be in peace. Why? Implication. Not everyone there is in peace. But Abraham, you have nothing to fear because when I gather you to them, you will be in peace, not in torment. Bam. And that's where Jesus' parable comes in. Abraham is there in peace with Lazarus in comfort, but the rich man whom he sees is in torment. So here God is assuring, assuring Abraham. When you go there, you have nothing to fear. You'll be in peace there. You catch it? Is it sinking in? That's why I repeat myself more than once, Jericho. Now let's see what happened to Abraham when he died. Genesis 25, 8 to 9. Genesis 25, verses 8 to 9. Genesis 25, 8 to 9. Send this dog on his merry way. Then Abraham gave up the ghost. I love the King James translation. It captures it. He gave up the spirit. So the spirit left his body, died in a good old age, an old man full of years, and was gathered to his people. Gathered to his people. Merrick, you, you, you really, I got to say this, in a crass way, you really suck at listening. You keep asking me questions. When I tell you be patient, I'll answer them. Now, verse 9. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah. Notice what took place first. He died, his spirit left, gathered to his people, and then his body was buried. Do you see the order? Abraham died because his spirit left his body. Then he was gathered to his people, and then his sons came and buried the body. Notice his being gathered to his people took place before the burial of his body. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah. And in that cave, there was only one other body, Sarah. Do you see the sequence? Spirit leaves his body, dies. Gathered to his people, and then the body is buried. That's what happens right now when you die. If you're in a hospital, your spirit leaves your body, you enter heaven, and then your loved ones come and take your body and bury it later. Did it sink in? Before I move on, let it sink in for a moment, what you're reading here. Deuteronomy 3, 1, 16. God says to Moses, notice what he says to Moses. Yes, medic. Near-death experiences are a fact of medical science 
That's why even doctors who are not Christian are now convinced on the basis of near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences, consciousness is separate from brain activity, and people continue to experience conscious existence and awareness when the brain and the body died, and they're not even Christians. So science is catching up to the Bible. Deuteronomy 3.1.16. Deuteronomy 3.1.16. Read with me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Vine, I want you to pay attention to this, and Andrew, you as well. Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people rise up and go a-whoring. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. When Moses died in Deuteronomy 34, it says God buried him in, in the peninsula, and no one knows where he was buried. How then did he go to sleep with his fathers? None of his fathers were there. In fact, where he was buried, no one knows where he was buried. So that they wouldn't come and take his tomb as a place of worship. Are you, you with me there? What does God mean to Moses that you will sleep, lie with your fathers? Lie with your fathers where? Where? When Moses died, he was buried at some location in the Arabian, not Arabian Peninsula, in the Sinai Peninsula. No one knows where because God kept it hidden from them. He was going to lay with them in the netherworld. No. Angela, you're not getting it either. Angela, I think I wasted time here because where in the world did you get that he's in heavenly Jerusalem at that time? Either I'm not communicating clearly or you guys are pretending to be listening. Where did you get before Christ when Moses and Abraham died, they went to heavenly Jerusalem? Where did you get that before Christ, when they died, they went to heavenly Jerusalem. I'll give you $50 million. Show me anywhere in the session I said that. I just spent an hour explaining that before Christ, they all went to Hades. They all to the same place. You with me there? Before I move on, just want to make sure you're getting it. Okay, I'm buffering. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Sometimes I don't have to be tough with you. Do you know why? Let me be honest with you. The level of biblical is sickening. Lana just said it. I love what she said. People must read the Bible. The level of of biblical illiteracy is sickening. Is sickening, right? We live at a time where we have so much information and we have access to so much information unlike any other generation of believers before us, but the level of biblical illiteracy is alarming. Alarming. It's alarming. No, my my internet connection is not to stop me an old lady. So we have to, we have to, you know, carry along. But anyway, okay. Now I'm not talking about those who are babes in faith, uh, Ledin. If you're a babe in faith, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about people who've been in the faith for ten years, fifteen years, twenty years, thirty years, and still they can't get it. And I'm not blaming you guys. I'm blaming the shepherds who are not shepherding. And ministering the word of God properly. Their judgment will be worse. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the babes. And the faith. And even those of you who have been seasoned veterans. I'm talking about the so-called shepherds. What are you doing? If you've been called to be a pastor. Or a Bible scholar. All you do is study the word. To make it understandable to the flock of God. Why are you not educating the flock. About these basics of the faith. Right, but now with that said, let's come back. Did we get the point? Jacob knew that if he dies, he goes to Sheol. 
And that's where he thought Joseph was because he thought Joseph was dead. Do you also see God telling Abraham, I'm going to gather you to your fathers in peace. But when Abraham died, his body was buried next to Sarah. There was no one else in that cave but Sarah and Abraham. So when God says, I'm going to gather you to your fathers, it can't mean physically. I'm not going to bury you physically with them because when he was buried physically, none of his fathers were there. So he must mean that when your spirit leaves your body, I'm going to gather your spirit to join the other spirits who have died, your fathers who have died. But when you get there, you'll be in peace because not everyone there is in peace. Some are in torment. Make sense? Make sense? It's sinking in? Okay, so now Jesus' parable makes sense when he comes back and says, in the netherworld, in the afterlife, rich man is in Hades in torment, but Abraham and Lazarus are there, but they're not in torment because up until the time of Christ going to heaven, all the souls went there, but they were not all in the same condition. All who went there, some were in peace, others in torment. Now we see this is parable. Two things we see. Let it sink in. We now see it's not simply a make-believe story. Jesus is actually referring to what actually takes place in the afterlife. That's number one. Number two, Jesus shows the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, that you can take God at his word and never doubt him for a second because God told Abraham, when I gather you to be with your fathers, you and bam, Jesus' parable shows not only is Abraham in peace and comfort, he's calling the shots there as a testimony to how good and faithful God is to those who love him. Do you see it? Do you see how Jesus' parable shows you how infinitely good, how infinitely faithful, wonderful God is, that when he says it, he'll do it? Because he told Abraham, when you die, I'll gather you there in peace. And in Jesus' parable, Abraham's in peace. He's in comfort, and he's calling the shots. Clear? Clear? Now, let me show you something about the condition of the dead up until Christ goes to heaven. Up until Christ goes to heaven. Everyone went to the same place called Hades Sheol. Two compartments there. Abraham's bosom, peace, and a place of torment, right? Okay, now, I need you to listen to me. When we talk about heaven, we talk about a place up there, right? That doesn't mean heaven is part of of the, the universe, if I travel far enough in space, I'll find it. But these are biblical metaphors, biblical imagery to highlight the fact that heaven is greater than the earth. Because when we talk about greatness, we imagine height, right? So if something is higher because it's more elevated, it's greater. And when we want to talk about humiliation, we talk about someone being brought under your feet or buried in the dust, right? Let me explain biblical metaphors. Are you ready? Because I'm going to go deep now. I'm going to go deep. I need you to listen. When the Bible talks about God in heaven or Jesus looks to heaven, God is not out there in space. I'm going to prove to you from the Bible, this dimension called heaven where God lives, it's not out there in space. So why do they look up? Because that's simply a manner of communicating the fact that just as the space above is higher than us and more exalted. God is much more exalted and greater than us. Because when we look at something that's very high and we see how exalted it is, that tends to, to give us the idea, the notion that it's great. Look at its height, man. It's Look how exalted it is. So this is simply a way of communicating the greatness of God in comparison to our temporal, finite, limited status. You with me there? And when we want to describe someone being humiliated, we talk about him eating the dust of the earth, being buried in the ground, being brought under my feet. 
So down, right? Oftentimes down refers to something humiliated, something brought low, something that's debased. When we talk about heaven or up, we talk about something exalted. And because it's exalted, it's great. Clear? I'm going to probably send Joshua Buckley on his way. We're talking about death and afterlife, and they're talking about the Trinity and hierarchies in the Trinity. I'm tempted to block Joshua, and I'm tempted to block Letton. Okay, is that clear now? Okay. Because God is exalted, the Bible describes him coming down. Because angels dwell with God in heaven, the Bible describes angels coming down, right? So when we talk about coming, God coming to earth, we talk about God coming down from heaven or angels coming down. Let's look at Matthew 28, verse 2. Matthew 28, verse 2. Where I'm going to go with this. Matthew 28, verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Did you catch it? Notice he didn't come up from the earth. He came down from heaven. Even though heaven's not part of space, so he wasn't coming out of space into the earth's atmosphere. That's the posture the angel took in order to describe his descent from this heavenly dimension the spiritual dimension called heaven. Are you with me there? Is it making sense? He wasn't coming down out of space. So why is it saying he came down from heaven? Because again, when we think of God's dwelling place, we think of it being exalted. We think of it being in the heights above. And so the angel adopts that posture of coming down to indicate to us that he's heavenly sent, sent from God's presence. With me there? Yes, it's a visual aid. Thank you, Michelle. But he doesn't really come down from space or the atmosphere above. Right? John 1, 51. You're going to see where I'm going with this. If you pay attention and you be patient, you're going to see where I'm going with this. John 1, 51. And he saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Notice they descend from heaven and ascend to heaven. Even Jesus, he came down from heaven, right? John 3.13. John 3.13. Watch here. John 3.13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. But wait, Jesus. Astronauts ascend to heaven, and they went out of the earth's atmosphere into space, landed on the moon. But Jesus does not using the language of ascent and descent in order to describe God's highly exalted status and his heavenly dwelling place where angels dwell, which is not part of creation. Is this sinking in? John 6, 38. John 6, 38. Because now you're going to get blown away. I take this time to repeat a point and give you passage after passage because I want you to see the depth of Scripture and be blown away. Here again, John 6, 38. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. So Jesus, did you come down from space? Were you on Mars? Venus, no. He's basically saying, this is the language I'm adopting. Because when we think of God, we think of him as being infinitely greater and more exalted than us. So what better way of illustrating that but to speak of heaven above and God being in heaven above with the angels above and coming down. Clear? Is it clear? So you saw angels come down from heaven. Jesus comes down from heaven. God comes down from heaven. The Holy Spirit comes down from heaven. Now, why am I hammering this point? Up until the time of Christ's ascension to heaven, if the believers who died went to be with God in heaven, then we would expect that when they appear, we'd be told they came down from heaven, right? In other words, if Moses were to appear to someone, we would expect the Bible to say that Moses came down from heaven, 
like angels came down from heaven. Jesus came down from heaven, right? Right? If they were already dwelling in heaven with God. Vine, everyone else, you following me? Andrew's been awfully silent. I hope he's still here. You getting it? But here's your problem, folks. 1 Samuel 28, verses 11 to 13. Samuel the prophet is dead. He then appears as a spirit being by God's permission. But notice what it does not say. Notice what it says. 1 Samuel 28, 11 to 13. Then said the woman, whom shall I bring up unto thee? Wait, wait, wait. Bring up, not bring down. Pay attention. Then said the woman, whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, bring me up, Samuel, not bring me down, Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, be not afraid, for what saw, sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Why? Why is he coming up from the earth? Why is he being summoned up, not down? Why is she summing him up? Why is he coming up, not down, like angels come down? Like Jesus comes down, like God the Father comes down, like the Holy Spirit comes down. Why is he coming up? Because she's now interpreting this event from her own pagan mindset. She thinks she's seeing a god. Remember, she's a witch. She's not an Israelite. Because they're not in heaven. Not at this time. Exactly, Alex. Now let's read 14 to 19. 14 to 19. Notice what Samuel's going to say. Now here is where you're going to see irrefutable proof that they went down to Hades. They didn't go up to God. Now watch. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. Well, no, Vine. Remember I said just like heaven is not up there physically, Hades is not down there physically, but this is simply God's way of illustrating the fact that the people in Hades are not dwelling in the heights with him. You hear me there? Vine? Just like you don't take it literally that God physically came down from a physical place in space. Don't take this literal. See it for what it is. God summoning the spirit from the ground as a way of illustrating that the netherworld, Hades, is not where God dwells. It's not in the heights. Okay, let me, let, let me read. Okay, I just had to clarify that. 14 again. And he said unto her, what form is he of? And she said, an old man cometh up. Old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. 15. And Samuel said to Saul, why hast thou disquieted me? Why have you interrupted my rest? No soul sleep, huh? Why have you interrupted my rest? To bring me up. Why'd you bring me up? Notice he didn't say, why'd you bring me down? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God... <clears throat> Let me get there, sorry. And God has departed from me and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, pay attention. Wherefore then dost thou ask me? Why do you ask me? Seeing Jehovah has departed from thee, has become thy enemy. Why would you ask me if God himself won't answer you? Jehovah hath done to him as he spake by me. For Jehovah hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Now watch this. Watch what he's going to say here. Right? Watch here. Because thou obeyest not the voice of Jehovah, nor execute his fierce wrath um, upon Amalek. Therefore hath Jehovah done this thing unto thee this day. Pay attention, 19. Moreover, Jehovah will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow shalt thou... 
and thy sons be with me, Jehovah also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Okay, guys. In 1 Samuel 25, it says Samuel was buried at a certain location. Continue reading all the way to the end of 1 Samuel. It says that Saul and his sons were attacked. Saul's sons were killed by the Philistines. Saul fell on his sword, committed suicide, and they were not buried the next day, but their bodies were desecrated and left out in the open without burial. But Samuel said, tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. But wait, Samuel, the next day when they died, physically they were not buried where you were buried. Their bodies were desecrated until finally their bodies were restored and given proper burial. So what do you mean they were going to be with you the next day? Tabor, you're trying so hard. Stop while you're ahead, man. This was too much for you. You're going to have to go back and listen because you're too focused on purgatory. Folks, for the rest of you, what does it mean that Saul and his sons joined Samuel the next day when they were not buried for a period of time, but their bodies were being desecrated by the Philistines and their bodies weren't then buried next to Samuel's body. But he said, tomorrow, all of you are going to be with me. Saul, you're going to be with me. Your sons are going to be with me. Medic, who said Saul went to the good part of Hades? So you're still not getting it. Just because Saul and his sons went to Hades doesn't mean Saul went to the good part because Samuel is saying, you're going to come to this dimension. But whether he's going to be in peace or in torment, that's left open. Is everyone getting it now? What did you learn from this discussion? Let's see if you learned. Yeah. Saul's son, Jonathan, went to the good part because he was a believer whom David loved, and he helped David. So we know he went to the good part. But as far as Saul is concerned, there is good evidence he went to the bad part and was tortured and tormented. There's good evidence for it. You want me to show you what the evidence is? Strong evidence that he was condemned to hell. 2 Samuel 7, 14 and 15. Specifically, verse 15. 2 Samuel 7, 14 and 15. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. God speaking about Solomon and speaking to David about Solomon. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. The fact that God would no longer speak to Saul, the fact that God was disgusted with Saul, the fact that God handed Saul over to be killed by the Philistines, and the fact that God just said, I took my mercy away from Saul, you can make a very strong case he went to hell. But let's look at 1 Samuel 28, 19 one more time. Yes, Jericho, there is tradition that suggests that the Jews at the time of Jesus called the good part of Hades, paradise, the paradise of Sheol. That's what they called it. First Samuel 28, 19. Moreover, Jehovah will also deliver us with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. Be with me where? They weren't buried with you, Samuel. In fact, when Saul committed suicide, fell on a sword, and his sons were killed, they weren't even buried for a period of time. Their bodies were desecrated. Where did they join you, Samuel? Now, Vine and everyone else, do you see how clear the evidence is from the Hebrew Bible that all of them knew physical death wasn't the end of conscious existence? They knew they would continue to exist consciously in their souls, in their spirits, apart from their bodies. This passage that I read to you is so powerful that soul sleepers like seven-day Adventists, you know what they say? 
they say, oh, no, that was a demon. That wasn't really Samuel. It was a demon that appeared as Samuel. You know how you refute that lie? Real quickly, you want to refute that lie? They'll tell you, no, that was a demon. No, that's what they say, Jericho. They'll say, no, that was a demon. Joe's witnesses, seven they happened to say it was a demon. It was a demonic apparition. Do you know how you refute that lie? Medic, you got it. The witch was shocked. She was stunned because that tells you she didn't summon him. When she was about to go summon him, he just popped up beyond her control, which shocked her. That's number one. Number two, why would a demon tell Saul the truth that God has rejected you? He's condemned you. You're going to die. And how did a demon know that the next day he was going to die? Right? Why would a demon confirm God's hatred, dislike, wrath, anger, and judgment upon Saul? And how did the demon know the next day he's going to join him? This wasn't a demon. It was the spirit of Samuel that God summoned a final time to rebuke and chasten Saul. No, demons can't predict the future. It's not that they can't. What the point is, when you add to the fact, not only is he saying that tomorrow you'll join me, you're going to be killed, but he confirms you're going to join me because it's God's judgment, because God is disgusted with you. He's handed, it over, he's handed you over to your sins. He's not going to kill you dead at the hands of the Philistines because he has nothing to do with you anymore. Why would a demon do that? Confirm God's judgment. David, you need to go, brother. Moses wasn't in heaven. You need to go. This is too much for you. You can't handle it, brother. You need to go and keep on milk. This, this channel is not for you. Everyone with me there? Do you see why? Do you see why it's not a demon? Why would a demon confirm God's judgment on Saul. And why was the witch horrified at seeing Samuel if she had summoned a spirit that was really a demon, even unbeknownst to her? And then how do, how do ancient Jewish sources understand this episode? Now, what I'm about to quote to you is considered inspired scripture by Catholics, Orthodox, and other various Christian groups. I'm going to quote the book of Sirach, chapter 46. Now, for those of you who don't believe in the Deuterocanonicals as scripture and don't believe Sirach is inspired, that's fine. Because it still tells you how the Jews, right? For those of you, pay attention, for those of you who do not believe that Sirach is scripture, that's fine because it still tells you how the Jews understood the story of 1 Samuel 28. So you don't have to accept it as scripture, right? To see how the Jews before the time of Christ interpreted 1 Samuel 28. Let me read it. I gave you the link, 1 Samuel 46. I'm going to read 13 all the way to 20. I'm going to read it in the new revised standard version. Pay attention. I gave you the link. It's Sirach 46, verses 13 all the way to 20. Watch. Samuel was beloved by his Lord. A prophet of the Lord, he established the kingdom and anointed rulers over his people. By the law of the Lord, he, Samuel, judged the congregation. The Lord watched over Jacob. <clears throat> by his faithfulness, he was proved to be a prophet. By his faithfulness, he was proved to be a prophet. Right? So far, are you with me? Okay. Samuel was beloved by his Lord, a prophet of the Lord. He established the kingdom, anointed rulers over his people. By the law of the Lord, he judged the congregation, and the Lord watched over Jacob. By his faithfulness, he was proved to be a prophet. And by his words, he became known as a trustworthy seer. So far, with me? Okay. Trustworthy seer. Verse 16. He called upon the Lord, the mighty one, when his enemies pressed him on every side. And he offered in sacrifice a suckling lamb. Then the Lord thundered from heaven, made his voice heard with a mighty sound. He subdued the leaders of the enemy and all the rulers of the Philistines. Now watch this. 
Watch this. Watch this, folks. Watch. Okay. Before the time of his eternal sleep, Samuel bore witness before the Lord and his anointed. No property, not so much as a pair of shoes, have I taken from anyone and no one accused him. Now watch verse 20. Post verse 20, if you can. Post verse 20. Even after he had fallen asleep, even after he died, he prophesied and made known to the king his death and lifted up his voice from the ground in prophecy to blot out the wickedness of the people. Tabor, stop asking me questions if you want to stay. Stop. Just listen. Stop. Did you catch it? Now, here is a pre-Christian Jewish source that Christians like Catholics and Orthodox Coptic take as scripture. So if you take it as scripture, here's the inspired commentary of 1 Samuel 28. If you believe it's scripture, here's an inspired commentary telling you it was Samuel's spirit who appeared from the ground to condemn the king and prophesy even after his death. Clear? You getting it? Did it make sense? Because I'm almost done. So, makes sense, right? Now, do you, do you see... That before Christ entering heaven, they weren't up in heaven with God and the angels, right? They were down, down, Hades, show. That's why Samuel's spirit came up. Right? Because it wasn't until Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven where the spirits of the righteous were allowed to enter into God's heavenly dwelling place. Let me prove that to you. Are you ready? Tonight, I want you to read Hebrews chapter 11 in its entirety on your own, and then Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 24. I'm just going to read Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. That's all I'm going to read. But you need to read Hebrews 11, because Hebrews 11 tells you who the spirits of the just men are. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Abel, Noah, Samson, Jephthah, all of them, they're mentioned. Joshua, Moses, all of them. So Hebrews 11 tells you who the spirits of the just men that are not dwelling in heavenly Jerusalem happen to be. So you got to read Hebrews 11 with Hebrews 12. Yep, this also answers another question. Neither Elijah nor Enoch went to God's heavenly abode. They were they went to Hades. So when it says Elijah was caught up to the heaven, it's not talking about heaven where God dwells. It's saying that when the chariots of fire came, he took off in the sky and vanished. Took off in the sky and vanished. This is where you get confused. Not every reference to heaven is God's abode. It can mean the sky above, like the birds in the heaven. So it's saying the chariots of fire took him, uh, took him into the sky and boom, disappeared. But where did he disappear to? To Hades. You thought wrong, Riaz, because you're going to contradict scripture in Hebrews 11 that says none of them were allowed to go to heaven until Jesus opened the way. None of them. Okay, do you want me to show you that? Do you want me to now take more time to unpack Hebrews 11, showing you that according to Hebrews 11, no saint before Christ opened heaven, entered heaven, where God dwells with angels. Do you want me to show you that? All right. I'm tired for you. You can hang. You guys are not tired with me preaching so long? Jericho, are you challenging me that Moses and Elijah went to heaven before Jesus opened heaven? Please tell me you're challenging me. Please. Okay. Hebrews 11, verses 8 to 10. 
Hebrews 11, verses 8 to 10. Okay? Let's read. Hebrews 11, verses 8 to, 8 to 10. By faith, now here's where you got to stop texting and read. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance, obeyed and he went out, not knowing whither he went. Pay attention. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Guys, vine everyone, verse 10. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. It's saying that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob looked for a city that God built. And now you're going to see that city is heaven. It's not Canaan. It's heaven. Verses 13 to 16. Hebrews 11, verse 13 to 16. Pay attention. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Pay attention. For they that say such things declare plainly they, that see, they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came, they came out of, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Now notice 16. What were they looking for? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of them. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Did you understand what Hebrews just told you? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob weren't looking for Canaan. They were looking for heaven. Their country was heaven, and they knew that's where they were destined to go. That heavenly country, that heavenly city, but they didn't receive it when they died. Sink it in. I'm not making it up. Sinking in. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew heaven was their country. But it says they died without obtaining that promise. The promise of heaven. 39 and 40. 39 and 40. In fact, let's read Hebrews 11, 35 to 40. Hebrews 11, 35 to 40. Watch. Hebrews 11, 35 to 40. Pay attention. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, eh? moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. Were tempted were slain with the sword they wandered about in sheepskin and goatskins being destitute afflicted tormented of whom the world was not worthy they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth and these all having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise god having provided some some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect if you read the verses before it He's talking about Joshua. He's talking about Jephthah. He's talking about Samson. He's talking about all the people that lived in Canaan. And he says all of them, even those who entered Canaan, obtained the promised land. All of them were looking for something better, a better resurrection than temporary resurrection, a better country. But it says they did not obtain it. 39. They did not receive the promise because God would not allow them to enter heaven and be perfected before we were perfected. You understand what you're being told? Did it sink in? Neither Abraham, nor Isaac, nor Jacob, nor Samson, nor Joshua, nor Jephthah, nor David, none of them received the promise of this heavenly country that God made. So then where did they go when they died? They knew they were going to end up there, 
They knew that heavenly city was theirs, but they could not enter until we would be perfected along with them by the death and resurrection of Jesus. So they had to wait for Jesus to come to offer his life to perfect all of us and then open up heaven by him entering there. So now after Jesus paid the price, entered heaven, now where are the spirits of those in Hades and Abraham's bosom? Where is the spirit of Abraham? Where is the spirit of Isaac? Where is the spirit of Samson? And where do all believers go when they die? Here's your answer. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Guys, stop texting right now because I want you to read. Stop texting. Read. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. No texting. Read. But ye, you, we're reading this, are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have now finally entered heavenly Jerusalem and to innumerable company of angels. And who's living in heavenly Jerusalem? Jerusalem above in heaven. Angels are there. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. They even have church there. In heaven, heavenly Jerusalem, they have church, okay, which are written in heaven. And to God, when you go to heaven, God is there. God the Father, the judge of all. And to the spirits of just men made perfect. Whoa. The spirits of these human beings are there in heaven with God, with angels, because now they've been perfected. The spirits of which men? The men you just read in Hebrews 11. And why are they there now? Because 24. Because Jesus is there, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh a better thing, better word than that of Abel. So now they're all there because the blood of Jesus has been shed and the blood of Jesus has been offered to the Father, allowing Abraham and all the spirits in Hades to have access to the Father and to dwell with angels and to see Christ in his glorified body. Finally, now they're all there. Yes, medic. Heavenly Jerusalem will come down at the end. It's the same. Is it sinking in? Yes, behold, I already went through that. You need to go back and listen to the entire session. I already went through that. Did you see how it worked? Up until Jesus' ascension, they all went to shield Hades. Some were in peace. Others were in torment. And then why did Jesus go down there for three days? Now here's why you're going to get blown away. Almost done. You know why he went down there? He went down there to Abraham's bosom to show the unbelievers what they lost. You lost out because you didn't believe the prophets. And to announce to Abraham, your redemption is here. Abraham, my friend. Abraham, my friend. Isaac, Jacob, Moses, you remember me when I used to walk with you in the Old Testament? I have now come to become flesh, to die for your sins. So now I have opened heaven's gates for you. You're coming home with me. <clears throat> Time to come home where you belong. He went to proclaim the victory. He went to proclaim the victory. He went there. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David. It is I, your Lord, who became flesh. I paid the price. The debt has been paid. Heaven's gates are open. Soon you will enter with me into glory. <clears throat> I have not forgotten you, my friends. See, it moves me in my spirit. Right? Yep, Bill Thompson, to set the captives free. That's what he did. Because though they were in peace, still they were not in perfect peace and joy. Because for them, perfect peace and joy 
was to dwell in the visible presence of the God who loved and adored them. As long as they were there, though they were happy like us, were, you know, their true happiness awaited them being before God on the throne and beholding his beauty and majesty. Right? <clears throat> so when Jesus went down, basically the message would be something like this. Obviously, I wasn't there to know. But it's basically, I haven't forgotten you, my people, my beloved, my friends. I haven't forgotten you. I have come. Time to come home. Let's go home. Abraham, let's go. Isaac, Moses, time to come home. The Father eagerly awaits your presence. The Father eagerly awaits to see you. And the angels are waiting to rejoice when your spirits enter with me in glory. Come home. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. You don't belong here. You belong with me. Time to take you home. <clears throat> right? So, now when you die, now when you die, where do you go? You go to be with Jesus if you're a believer. Now when you die, your spirit leaves your body. It doesn't go to Hades anymore. It goes to heaven where you behold God the Father in visible glory, visibly appearing, angels and Jesus in his glorified body. Right? So now Hades has now become the abode of unbelievers. Before, there were two compartments. Now it's completely the abode of the unbelievers. There is no compartment in Hades anymore. Now can you imagine if you're the rich man and other unbelievers and you see Jesus come down in his human spirit, the human spirit of Christ going down, and then you see that compartment of Hades being emptied out and then Hades expanding. The pain, the misery, the anger at seeing that. Yes, they were waiting for the resurrection. You catch it now? So now, when it says in Acts 2, let's see what it says about Jesus. Acts 2, 29 to 32. Exactly, Dilijan. That was the first rapture, Dilijan, where the spirits of the righteous in Abraham's bosom got raptured and the wicked were left behind. That was the first rapture that took place in Hades. Acts 2, 29, 32. Now read this. Now you can answer the question, did Jesus go to hell, the lake of fire? Let's see. Read with me. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, one of his physical descendants, he would raise up, God would raise up a physical descendant from David, and that physical descendant would be Christ. He would raise up Christ to be his physical descendant, to sit on the throne, David's throne. Watch what it says about David. He, David, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus had God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. 31, one more time. Acts 2, 31, one more time. Medic, let me call Gabriel in heaven and ask him. Uh, Gabriel, why was God pleased to allow the King James translators to translate Hades and Gehenna as hell? Oh, you get back to me? When? Oh, when Jesus returns? All right. Medic, yeah, you're going to have to wait for the answer because Gabriel said he's going to get back to me at Jesus' return. Okay. Acts 2.31. Acts 2.31. One more time. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did, did see corruption. Folks, guess what the word hell is in Greek? Guess what the word hell is in Greek? Hades. Notice Jesus' soul was in Hades. But where was his flesh? In the grave. So if I translate the word 
hell as Hades. That means Jesus didn't go to hell, hell, the place of torment to be burned in fire. He went to Sheol where everyone went when they died. There you go. It's Hades. There's the link. So here you're being told Jesus is human soul, his human spirit, the human spirit of Christ, left his physical body, his human soul, his human spirit, went where all the spirits went, to Hades, to Sheol, whereas his flesh remained in the grave. Right? Tartarus is usually on your fish sandwich. If you go to like McDonald's and order a fish sandwich, you're going to find a lot of Tartarus on it. Okay, so now, does Acts 2, 31 trouble you when it says that his soul was not left in hell? Or do you now understand what it doesn't mean? Do you now understand what it doesn't mean? When it says Jesus' soul was not left in hell, it doesn't mean the fiery place of torment. It means he went to Sheol, Hades, where they all went. Jacob went there. Abraham went there. Samuel went there. They all were there. But they were in that compartment of peace, not torment. Is it clear now? Did it make sense? Because now I'm the final point and I'm done. Remember I said heaven is not part of the physical universe. So then why do we look to heaven? Because that's simply a posture that we adopt in order to recognize God being greatly exalted above us. Right? Now, you want me to prove to you that heaven is not part of the physical dimension? It's part of a separate dimension? Are you ready for the proof, everyone? Who's ready for the proof? It's not out there. It's a dimension that the door to which opens up. It's a dimension in which the door to which opens up right in front of you. Okay? Mark 1.10. So imagine there is a dimension that exists side by side with the physical dimension. So you have a spiritual dimension, physical dimension, and they exist side by side. And there is a door that separates, a veil that separates the two. Here you go. Here's proof. Mark 1.10. And straightway coming out, out of the water, he saw the heavens open. The verb rent open. So he's looking at the sky. It opens up and the spirit comes down. And the spirit like a dove descending upon him. Do you see what happened here? If you were standing there, all you'd see was the sky. But all of a sudden... The heaven were rent open and the other dimension appeared. And from that dimension, the Holy Spirit came down. Amen, Vine. It is glorious. Vine, I need you to pray hard and fast hard for me and my daughters. That God will continue to fill me with wisdom, knowledge, understanding, faith, love, devotion, holiness, and purity. And fight for me and my daughters so I can continue to serve all of you until I die for the glory of Jesus. Exactly, Joshua. So when scientists talk about parallel universes, they're not that far away from the truth. What they're calling parallel universes is actually a parallel dimension called heaven. That's right there side by side with this physical universe. Acts 7, 55 to 56, specifically Acts 7, 56. Thank you, Dilijan. I need it. Acts 7, 55, 56, specifically verse 56. Watch. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened. So he's looking at the sky, and bam, it opens up again. And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Wow. <whistles> Revelation 4, verses 1 to 2. Revelation 4, verses 1 to 2. Truly glorious session. After this, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. Vine, did you see it? A door open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee the things which must be there thereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit. So the Holy Spirit 
took him and transported him through that door to enter that other dimension. Do you see it? Vine never once, did you see it? A door in heaven opened, and the Spirit took me and transported me through that door, and I was on the other side. Yeah, you can use plane too, Bill, Billy Mandley. As long as you're explaining that it's another dimension that's not part of the physical universe. And then I'm going to give you some deathbed stories. Remember, since the Bible is true, we shouldn't be surprised to find confirmation of the truth of the Bible in everyday life. So I'm going to give you two deathbed stories from eyewitnesses that told me these stories firsthand. Okay? But now, let me give you another one. Isaiah 64, verse 1. Guys, stop the side talk about purgatory. I'm going to start blocking you, bouncing you. Focus on the message. Isaiah 64, 1. Notice the heart of Isaiah. Pay attention. Isaiah 64, verse 1. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, that thou wouldst come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. See what he's saying? Oh, God, that you would tear open the dimension of heaven and come out of it and descend to the mountains so I can see you. You guys see it? Oh, that you would rend the heavens open. Tear open the heavens. And that you would come down. Do you see the repeated teaching? Heaven is not out there physically. Contrary to what your liberal professors will tell you in mockery of the Bible. Oh, the Bible imagines a three-tiered universe. And on top is heaven where God dwells. That tells you there are a bunch of morons and idiots that don't know the Bible. Because that's what they'll tell you. Oh, the Bible writers imagine a three-tiered cosmogony. Right. And up there was God. Really? Is that why we keep reading a door opened to heaven? Heavens were rent asunder? Heavens open? Because they thought where God dwells was out there somewhere? Really? Exactly, first and last. Now, let me end it with two Deathbed stories. Let me end it. Now I need you to listen. Are you ready? Ready? True stories, and I heard it from the witnesses. A young lady, her friend was dying of cancer. And this, by the way, please do me a favor. Confirm this for yourselves. Go to the hospice where people die. Talk to the nurses and doctors, and they'll tell you this. Are you ready? They'll tell you this. They'll tell you that people, when they're about to die, they see the other side. So they'll be looking at the ceiling, the window, or around them and having conversations with loved ones or even angels right before they die. Okay? I'm not making this up. Confirmed by people who work in hospices. Okay? Medic, please come back with stories because God is going to confirm the truth of what I'm about to tell you. Okay. Now, this lady told me her friend, a sister in the Lord, was dying of cancer. The day that she died... The pastor was there, the church was there, and she was there to pray and sing songs to make it easy for her to die. Now watch this. She's telling me the story. I heard it from her mouth. I heard it from her mouth. She goes, I sat next to her. So she's sitting right here to her right. As she's dying, folks, and Nada, maybe you can share your story. As she's dying, she goes, look at the angels in the room. And they're looking. They don't see anybody. Look at the angels in the room. There's Jesus. He's calling me. And she died. The people there didn't see anything because the veil was open for her. It was her time to go. She saw it, not them. You with me there? Let me give you a second story. And I'll even give you the man's name. His name is Jerry Comer. Jerry Comer. A young lady, member of the church, good friends with his wife. Hear this story. You want to get blown away? Maria, good to see you, sister. Don't forget me. Right? Keep praying for me and my miracle. Okay, now, listen to this story. Jerry Comer. Jerry Comer. Okay? 
He got up in front of my Bible class that I used to teach in Chicago, shared this story, and it's actually recorded. Pay attention to this. Okay. Young lady, father was a sign painter, died of cancer. That week she came to church, and he's telling us the story about a couple of weeks after the man had died. She's smiling. She's happy, right? So they're wondering, why are you so happy? Your father just died. And she goes, I know it's kind of weird Looks that, you know, that I'm so happy. But then she shared the story. Guys, listen to what happened to her father. He was a sign painter, and because of the fumes, he went blind and contracted cancer. Remember, he went blind, and he was dying of cancer from the fumes, from being a sign painter. Pay attention now. Blind, man. Remember, blind. Can't see with his physical eyes. He's on the bed, and he goes, there's Peter and John. Notice what he see. There's Peter and John. Now, his wife said, how do you know who they are? You know what he said? Believe me, when you see them, you're going to know who they are. And then watch this, folks. Watch this. Watch this. He looked up. Remember, he's blind. He's blind. He looked up. There's Jesus. And he's holding up a sign saying, welcome home. And he died. I don't think you got it. Guys, can I ask you a question? What was he seeing and how did he see? His physical eyes were blind. He was seeing with the eyes of his spirit. And what he saw was Jesus holding up a sign saying, welcome home. Now, why was Jesus holding up a sign? Because he was a sign painter. And Jesus, in his humbleness and love, wanted to make his death easy by showing him a sign to <clears throat> comfort him. Basically saying, you have nothing to be afraid. You're coming home. Right? But folks, the people there didn't see anything. What did he see? The veil open for him. Because heaven is not part of the physical universe. It's another dimension that exists side by side. So Jesus, the infinitely beautiful God, the humble God, the humble God, right? Puts up a sign. <clears throat> well, come home. You don't have to be afraid anymore. Right? So that's what I envision Jesus did when he died on the cross. And his spirit left his body. All of a sudden, guys, imagine what it'd be like. Use your imagination. You're Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you're in the netherworld. Knowing the day will come, you're going to see God visibly. And all of a sudden, a spirit descends. Guys, imagine this. Imagine this. Spirit, <clears throat> the spirit descends. And you recognize him. And he says, I'm here. Abraham, my friend. Orahim Khori, Khori Orahim, my friend, <clears throat> I have not forgotten you. I'm here to take you home. I've done it. It is finished. Let's go home. <clears throat> I can't imagine when they saw him saying, we're going home. You're coming home. Let's go. Come on, let's go. We're going home. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, we love you on their behalf. And I know they come in agreement as I represent them. We are in love with you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And please, we ask, Father, please, Lord Jesus, please, Holy Spirit, please, seal us by your infinite power to never deny you, never betray you, never falter, but fall more in love with you and die for you. And give us the power to live for you. And Lord, please fight for my children. Please bring them to me and provide for us and sustain us. And use me for your glory. And your will be done, Lord. If you want me to be with someone, your will be done. If not, I am yours completely. We are yours. And we need you. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, amen. Go back, listen to this session and yesterday's session. Now you have two sessions I did on death, afterlife, Hades, Gehenna, 
You got it all. Study the arguments, absorb them, share them, proclaim them. Because Christ is alive and he's conquered death and death is not the end of us. Love you guys. Keep praying for my miracle. Take care.